Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining this exciting Women in Tech webinar presented by RSA Web. By way of introduction, my name is Leonor. I'm the head of enterprise at RSA Web, and I will be the MC for this webinar. So we have seen some of the statistics about equality in the workplace. And unfortunately, women remain significantly underrepresented in emerging tech. Women currently hold 19% of tech-related jobs at the top 10 global tech companies. And of those leadership positions, they hold 28%. In South Africa, the portion of females to males who graduate with STEM-related degrees, STEM is science, technology, engineering, and maths. The proportion in ICT and technology is two to five. And as a result, there is a significantly smaller pool of women entering the workforce. And even worse, South Africa sometimes suffers from what's known as brain drain. We have these talented individuals immigrating. So today we have an amazing panel of six women who represent private and public sector, as well as those who've had an extensive career in technology and some who've made a sudden switch to technology. I'm going to let them introduce themselves and what their current roles are within the tech sector. Um, over to you, Carrie. Good morning, everybody. I'm Carrie from Flandrum. Great to be chatting to some amazing women um, and share on this panel with you guys. I've actually been CEO of ESET for 10 years now. It's coming up on my 10-year anniversary, but been in the industry for about 15 years. You know, I studied uh, at UCT information systems, didn't really want to or know that I want to be in tech, but I landed up in it and I absolutely love it. But the most part of it is the people that I love. And it's difficult because it's not necessarily, um, like you say, uh, female orientated, but um, I know that my position in life now that I've been given this opportunity really is to kind of showcase what we can do as, as female leaders. Um, and be authentic female leaders and be amazing leaders. Yeah, so it's it's so great to be sharing some of this information with you guys at Women's Day, and I look forward to all the great questions that are coming up. Thanks, Carrie. And Lisa, over to you. Good morning, everyone. And yes, again, thank you, Leonor and RSA Web for the opportunity. So I'm Lisa Stradom, and I head up channel for a company called Veeam. We're a software IT vendor in uh, the marketplace and we've been around for, I think it's about 12 years now. I've been fortunate to be part of the organization for seven years and uh, I've been in IT for over 15 years. But yeah, enjoying it. Um, just as Kerry was saying, it's an exciting industry to be in. Uh, and for me, I think it's about the change that we're always constantly facing in uh, being in IT, which makes it so exciting. So, yeah, I'm really enjoying it. I love the, the journey and um, looking forward to what today holds in store for us. So thank you again. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Nomfunda, over to you. Morning, ladies. Thank you for inviting me to this um, platform. I'm Nomfunda Nzanya. I'm the IT manager for Johnson & Johnson. Um, I've been in IT for 10 years now, but worked in different aspects of IT, largely the consumer business, but I've also been in development um, and in IT audit. And as everybody else has already mentioned, it's actually been a very interesting journey, constant changes, constant learnings, and those are one of the main things that have really kept me within IT and the things that I love and enjoy. Thanks again for this platform to share all our experiences and also to learn from you ladies. Thanks, Nomfunda. And uh, Ameshni? I am very excited today to form part of uh, the session. I think every time that uh, I have a chance to sit with uh, some women in tech, um, it's almost as I think you've highlighted earlier from a stats perspective, uh, something unusual to do um, because typically in the boardroom uh, it is with a lot of males in the room alongside few women. So it is great to be able to uh, chat to leaders in the industry uh, and female leaders from that perspective. Uh, my name is Amir Shani Naidu. Uh, I am the CIO, the Director of Information Systems and Technology at the City of Cape Town. I have just under 20 years of experience uh, leading digital transformations, both locally and globally. Uh, I come from both the consulting background uh, with many years of experience uh, in uh, digital consulting as well as management uh, consulting experience and um, have recently over the last six to seven years uh, taken on CIO roles uh, in order to look at digital transformations. And I thoroughly look forward to uh, engaging with you. 
It's exciting to have ladies like you in our public sector. And then Wendy, over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Wendy, Wendy Bailey. Um, I head up our consumer and SME division for RSA Web. Uh, this includes all teams uh, from our logistics, sales, projects, and our support desk. Uh, we started a focused consumer division back in 2015. Our first fiber network operator was Ocotel. And over the last five years, we went from being an enterprise-focused organization to now having a multi-focus on both consumer, SME, and then channel and enterprise. We partner with over 10 fiber network operators now um, and have gone from being a company with no consumer focus to being within one of the top five ISPs across South Africa. Uh, we have over 50 employees in our department and uh, really have had a big focus over the last couple of years to differentiate ourselves in terms of our customer experience. And happy to say we're now sitting on a 4.4 Google rating, uh, which is within the top three ISP ratings on Google. Uh, very happy to be with some very powerful women here today and looking forward to, to the webinar. Sharon, over to you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sharon Bergatine. I head up robotics and cognitive services at Old Mutual. I have just over 15 years of experience um, in technology. I am responsible for implementing AI and robotic strategies and practice uh, setting up the practice and capability. I thoroughly enjoy what I do. I feel it is um, basically creating a new world. I've been extensively involved in mentoring and guiding young females in this aspect. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to engage and learn from you all. Thanks, Sharon. Firstly, I just want to find out how some of you ladies got started in tech and what experiences led you to technology as a career. So, Emeshni, you studied info systems at Rhodes almost 20 years ago. Um, I can't imagine you had many ladies in your class. Can you tell us a little bit about what that was like? Uh, yeah, so actually, interestingly, um, how I got into tech is because I studied uh, computer science at high school, which I actually think uh, was uh, almost unseen. Of. I was probably one of two females in the class who did that. And, and from there, I uh, had an interest in computer science and probably just a mathematical uh, kind of uh, background as well. And that's mm. what prompted me to go into computers. Um, I also was uh, really lucky in that I had great uh, kind of family around me that was in the tech industry. And so speaking to them, I think they had the foresight to counsel me, to talk to me about what tech could do in the world. Um, and in the real sense, not just in kind of bits and pieces of zeros and ones, but more in the sense of how it could add real value and where tech was moving to into the future. I did a project in high school on artificial intelligence at that point in time. Um, and so I think, you know, having that exposure made a huge difference. And it's what encouraged me to then go to Rhodes University to study information systems and computer science. Uh, at university, yes, once again, I was uh, one of probably in a class um, of, I say, you know, by the time I got to third year, about 60 students, probably about five to seven uh, females. And so, yes, uh, very limited in terms of the number of females uh, that was there. And if I think about my career, um, it's been interesting because I can almost see that as a trend uh, throughout my career. But with that said, uh, I must also highlight that, you know, I've been coached and mentored throughout my career by very powerful women uh, that have taught me um, how to engage in the industry and have helped me to feel comfortable with being a female in this industry and to not have to feel that I needed to be highly different or not be me. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, so that's been uh, really great. That's so interesting. And Carrie, you also formally studied at UCT. Do you believe you would have ended up on this career path had you not done a formal degree? Yeah, that, very interesting because uh, listening to the previous story, I'm kind of not at all drawn to technology and I never was. And I <laughs> had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, and I, I literally just did just followed my sister because that's kind of what she studied at UCT. Um, and I studied information systems and um, but on the side of not actually knowing what I wanted to do, I always knew, like you said, that that was where technology was going. Technology was going to be part of the future. Um, and uh, absolutely, yeah, from the beginning, in, the, in, in terms of our class, there was a really small percentage of females. I don't feel it's really... 
dramatically changed much since then, and I also don't want to give away my age, but it was some more, some 20 years ago. Um, but, but uh, you know, moving from there, we went straight into what you would call a kind of a startup garage and found kind of uh, a, a amazing tech and ESET. Um, so we went from garage to um, global, I guess, but, um, you know, the, the tech, the tech side of me really chose me, I guess, because uh, part of uh, my path, I think, was always wanting to to try and grow people, try and lead people, um, and uh, fundamentally, I know that is my motivational cause to 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 bring people up um, into who they the best they can be, and totally agree with you as well. I had amazing uh, people focus me into the fact that um, I don't really want to focus really on women and tech. And being a woman, I don't think it's necessary, but it's absolutely our duty as those who have uh, have some kind of stand and leadership to be able to show those around us that really they can do anything in tech. There really is very limited amount of people around us that are uh, focusing on the women's side, but um, I think it's our duty to show kind of authentic leadership. We can still be, you know, soft heart, but a strong back leader, um, and that, that's mm. our duty. And Wendy, you on the other hand came into the tech industry from a previous career in HR. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, my background was actually industrial psychology. Um, that's what I, I have my degree in. And when I joined RSA Web, um, it, it really was quite a, an interesting experience for me. I remember my first day feeling quite like a, a fish out of water, sitting in those management meetings, thinking they weren't speaking uh, English, um, but really found it so fascinating and just the power of technology and the power of what we were doing and um, being able to see real life case studies of, of how we were changing, changing businesses, how we were changing South Africa. Um, and that's what I wanted to see. And I was given an opportunity by a, a great mentor of mine, um, who was the founder of, of RSA Web, uh, to, to start the new division, to start the consumer division, uh, using my, my skill set from uh, industrial psychology to, to employ, uh, to train um, and, and build out that team. And from there, it, it's just taken over my life. Um, and and obviously I'm, I'm in the position I'm in today and I, I wouldn't be anywhere else. Um, it, it for me is has been absolutely amazing and technology is something I'd never thought I would find myself in. Um, I've always loved it, found it very daunting but very fascinating. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm, I'm thrilled yeah. to see and speak to people every day where our product is is literally changing their lives, changing mm. their business. Yeah. And I must, from my own experience, I must give kudos to the men of the industry as well who've seen um, and and kind of pioneered and coached and mentored. I think they they are also incredibly dynamic in that they see past gender and they coach and mentor as well. So what would be the biggest challenge for the next generation of women and how can we be strong role models for them? Numfundo, you've been with some exciting companies like Mr. Price, KPMG, and now you're with Johnson & Johnson. What would you say about the challenges for, for the next generation of women? So the challenges for the next generation of women would be sort of like similar to the ones that we're currently experiencing, which would also relate to the opportunities that are available out there for them and even exposure to technology earlier on in their lives because there's this sort of glass ceiling, if you may put it that way, when it comes to opportunities, especially for women. And so that is one definite challenge that they will still be facing, which really requires women like us and ourselves that are already within the industry to set a foundation for them or a roadmap or a way for them to be able to actually enter and penetrate into, into this industry. Um, so it's actually quite a, a huge responsibility on us to also be these role models that the likes um, of the other women in this panel already have, where we actually create opportunities for the next people. Because um, if we don't do that, then people will stay knocking on a door which will never really open. So it's actually really up to us already in there to open these platforms and open these doors for the next generations to come. Always take the time to equip them just to make it that little much easier for them um, to, to, to partake in this journey and likewise, hopefully, they'll also do the same for the next yeah. woman and the next generation.
Agreed. Sharon, you really are pioneering some of the most groundbreaking technology at the moment. What do you, what would you say is the biggest challenge for the next generation? So I think for me, the biggest challenge for the next generation is actually understanding that the only limitations we actually have is our own. These are not limitations that are set by the universe. It's not limitations that are set by hierarchy. It's not limitations that are set by different standards and methodologies. It's limitations of, of one's own thinking. What I find to be quite challenging being a woman and a mother of a one-year-old is that the shift as we move towards cloud technology uh, and, and cloud in, in every context and in every sense of the word and artificial intelligence robotics, it's very demanding. It's not a job that is eight to five, you switch on and you switch off and that's it. And that, this, in, in, in lots of ways, challenges you as a person, me as a mother, in, in making sure and ensuring that I have boundaries that not just um, supportive of me and my family and my life, but also of what I'm trying to do. Now, I can very easily be interpreted when you're not available um, because of your own family commitments and responsibilities that you then do not have the right to the seat at the table. But absolutely important for you as a female to firstly understand, appreciate, and own your seat. Uh, it is not mm. time-bound. I'm a firm believer that work is something you do, not somewhere you go, and it's not restricted to time. So that's mm. the first challenge. Mm. The second challenge that I think we as women face as we move forward, uh, not just in the past of the fourth industrial revolution, but in general, is needing to understand that we have been told for years not to be emotional. We have been told that being emotional in the workplace is something uh, somewhat, to some extent, uh, not to be proud of, and it will be career limiting even for that matter. But as you move forward, it is absolutely relevant and important for you to be empathetic. You need to be able to relate to people. You need to be able to perform the roles that whether it's robotics or artificial intelligence or it is a service provider that's bridging these uh, service integrations into your organization, you need to be able to have empathy and to be able to understand others and coach others and lead others. So I think that's an absolutely crucial skill. Um, of course, then there's the general things in terms of technology that you need to make sure you keep yourself abreast with. Um, and the, the, the challenge with that is that it's constantly changing. So you've got to be hungry and you've got to be willing to give it your all. Yeah, no, 100%. And Lisa, you are a leader within V, managing channels across Africa. What would you say the biggest challenges for the, the next generation? Great. So thanks, Lenore. And um, I totally agree with what Sharon was saying. You know, we, um, we have been paved a road. And if you look at women in the 30s, the 50s, how they fought for, for what we have so many rights for today, we should really take that as an opportunity and really use it as a springboard for, for what we can do in business today because um, we've been given that opportunity. We can show people that we are allowed a, a seat at the table, just like Sharon mentioned. You know, what I find is, is challenges are opportunities. So it's also how you look at things and um, having a different mindset. So in some instances, you know, it, you may see it as a barrier to entry, but looking past that, it can actually give you so much more um, that you can actually de deliver different things within an organization. Um, you know, I actually listened to a podcast by a guy called David Goggins. I don't know if any of you have listened to him, but here's a man who, who had so much against him in life. And... And, um, you know, he, he overcame all of all of those obstacles that he had, but he, he came out of it so much stronger, um, somebody that actually showed that, you know, through life, if you just take those challenges and make them your own and make them opportunities, anything is possible. So, you know, in channel today, um, we deal with many people. We've got so many different cultures that we deal with on a daily basis, which makes it exciting. And I do find that, yes, there are still not as many women in IT um, in channel as what we would like. But if we come up with some good programs that can actually support ladies um, to, to think of IT as a, a job option, uh, we really need to support that in IT mm. in all our organizations. Mm. I like that theme, sort of let's turn the challenge into an opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Um, so... 
Imeshni, what advice would you have for women in the field of technology who are struggling or experiencing imposter syndrome? Great question. And I think that what comes to my mind is I've heard before that when males go to interviews, they typically go into positions where even if they don't feel they can do the job just as yet, uh, they go ahead and they, you know, they put themselves in front of the crowd in order to be interviewed, whereas females typically, on the other hand, ensure that they can do the job plus more before they would choose to go uh, into interviews. I think that's that kind of speaks to, I would say, imposter syndrome in some ways, but in other ways, I think just the nature of females who I think, you know, typically have the nature that says that they uh, they need to be good at what they do and they almost need to be perfect at what they do uh, before they do it. And so for me, that is something that I think as female leaders in the industry, it is something that we must continue to coach and mentor females that are coming into the industry on, which is to not be afraid of who they are and not to be afraid to take a risk. Um, and it's something that I think as female leaders, we tend to surprise ourselves when we are put into positions uh, and almost feel like we're in the deep end. Uh, but I think it's a, we surprise ourselves as to how fast we can get out of that and how we can excel. Um, so I think that, you know, coaching and mentoring is something that we must continue to do. Um, and I think as female uh, leaders in the industry, it's also to showcase uh, and provide those references of where we've taken those risks and it's been okay. And that actually, you know, we've come out of it uh, standing taller and also being able to grow off that. Mm. That's great advice. And Carrie, having been with ESET for so long and in the industry, do you still suffer from imposter syndrome? <laughs> yeah, good point. I've been, been here for so long and also being a family business, you kind of think, well, obviously I've got this position because I'm in a, in a family and that's how I got it. I've learned the absolute opposite. And I, and I think a lot of what you can teach, like you were saying now, Mishni, the young generation is that it's actually okay to be who you are. And women who, with a heart and empathy is actually an amazing contribution to being to a business. And that brings authentic leadership. A lot of the old school um, in terms of women in leadership, we thought, okay, well, let's try and hide who we are. Um, I'm, I'm actually quite strong and that's not seen as a good thing. Often in women, I'm quite dominant. A lot of the old school women don't want to be seen as dominant, but in fact, you're actually just really good at what you're doing and that is who you are and that is your, your absolute blessing in life. So rather, rather own who you are. And, and in fact, in terms of the imposter syndrome, I feel that often I'm also a mom of two and I, sometimes I feel like an imposter mom. And then when I'm not an imposter mom, I'm, I'm a great mom and then I'm an imposter CEO. So um, trying to balance those two hats uh, is really difficult. Uh, when, do you, when aren't you the imposter at home and when aren't you the imposter? Mm. Um, because absolutely, you were saying earlier that, you know, uh, you know work is not just um, at the office, it is often at home. Um, but really what we should be doing and what I try and teach my daughter is that I teach her the opportunities that, that for example, um, my mom didn't have being a woman and the limitation she had or people of color didn't have not so long ago. So just to be who you are and love who you are um, and take that blessing and grow on that, it's, it's, it seems so simple, but it's so important, I think, for, for the growth of, of the young women and, and what they can become. And Sharon, you've been with amazing South African companies like Woolworths, F&B, APSA, and now with Old Mutual. Is it safe to say that you don't suffer from imposter syndrome anymore? <laughs> so I wouldn't say that it's safe to say that, um, okay. but, I, but I certainly, um, I would say the majority of the time don't have imposter syndrome. Uh, I think the reason for that is you've got to allow yourself to fail fast but allow yourself to be vulnerable. Now, for you to be mm -hmm. able to do that, you do need an organization and leadership, whether that's, whether that's a sponsor or a line manager, or it's a friend, it's a coach, it doesn't matter, but just somebody who's sort of reassuring you that it's okay. It's okay to not know the answers. It's okay to be, um, uh, you know, um, trying something out. I mean, I think the thing that, that makes a person feel like an imposter sometimes is that exactly that thinking that you need to know the answers. But absolutely everything in this world 
started off from an idea, whether it's a laptop, a phone, a, an airplane. Nobody knew exactly how it was going to work and what was going to happen and how it needed to all fit together. So, um, yeah, I think when I started off my career, I suddenly had imposter syndrome, um, working uh, in different industries and working with some really, really, really heavy titans, you know, and I call them the titans because they are in that in those roles for for good reason uh, and they do challenge you they challenge the way you think mm. they challenge what you bring to the table they challenge absolutely everything and then you have some supporters and you have the others who are sort of like mm, I don't really want to see her succeed you know and I'm going to pull her down these things happen um, so, yeah, originally, I think I did, I suddenly felt an imposter syndrome and I struggled to own my own space and my own voice and to appreciate that which I brought to my organization, to my friends, to my colleagues. Mm. Um, and as time went on and my confidence grew, that is the key. My confidence mm. grew only with experience that I start to understand and appreciate that I'm not an imposter. Just believing in the value that you bring. And um, Wendy, is this something that you experience coming from a different background? Absolutely. Um, I don't even think it's necessarily the the background. Um, I think as these other women have, have said, I think we we all feel that in, in some way or form, whether it's in our jobs, whether it's in the, the industry we're in, or even just in our home life. Um, but I think the most important thing to understand is that it, it is a feeling. You know, the only way to combat feeling like an imposter is to stop thinking like one. And I don't think there's a quick fix for it. You know, there's no tips on how we can change the way that someone feels. There was a, a book that was written um, by a, an expert in imposter syndrome by Valerie Young. Um, she wrote the book Secret Thoughts of Successful Women and Why Capable People Suffer from Imposter Syndrome and How to Thrive in Spite of It. And she said that in order to thrive despite, you need to be able to separate those facts from feelings. You know, there, there will be times that we're going to feel stupid. There, there are going to be times that we feel we don't belong. And that's okay. It's, it's actually normal. You know, we feel it. Our, our male counterparts feel it. Um, but realizing that feeling stupid doesn't make you stupid. You know, recognizing that sometimes your feelings are absolutely normal, a normal reaction that anybody would have. And I think that's what I try and do. Um, I try and see it and, and take a step back from it and acknowledge my feelings, understand them to be just that, you know, feelings, and remember my achievements and, and being proud of them and knowing that I've earned my space, I've, I've earned my place here. It wasn't just handed to me. I worked hard, you know, and, and I'm here because I'm meant to be here. And I can't let anyone else's opinions or my own insecurities stand in my way. Um, I deserve this. And, and that's what I want other young women to, to know as well, that they too can, can have anything that they want and anything they put their mind to. Um, the only thing that can stop imposter syndrome is us. Very well said. Very well said, Wendy. Numfundo, what have been some of your biggest successes and biggest learning opportunities in your career? So um, in my career, some of my biggest successes, well, it would be the latest one, which is getting um, this role in at Johnson & Johnson. Um, but the, the biggest success in this role, it's not just a business partnering role, but it's actually a role that has landed me a seat um, in, in the leadership team in, in, the, in the South Africa um, board. So for me, that was one of the very huge successes um, in my career thus far, um, which obviously comes with also a different set of challenges um, in itself. So it's both a success and a challenge in itself. In that um, in this role, it's, it's it's different from the previous roles that I've been in, where most of the roles have been purely technology roles. Whereas in this role, we have to master being an IT consultant, um, at the same time being an IT strategist, um, and at the same time just being present to be, um, just to being a member of the board that is actually objective, that provides a particular opinion, which is not necessarily technology related. Mm -hmm. um, and also just learning when and how to actually put all these different things forth, when to put on the strategist hat and when to put on the consultant hat, when to be an advisor and when not, you know. So for me, that has really been quite a learning curve um, in this short space um, that, that I've been in this role. Um, because even when you join a company, um, you have to hit the ground running. 
yes, there will be understanding that you are still new, you're still trying to find your 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 place here, and it's a new city for me. Um, so it's new people, everything is practically. <laughs> But it's also um, in terms of doing all of that whilst you're building the relationships, um, whilst at the same time you're trying to come across as a person that will bring um, empowerment and betterment in the role for this um, company. Um, so it, it's just having to do all these things in a go and in the manage, in managing all of that, that has really been quite of a challenge for me. But I've been blessed with a very supportive team um, which makes allowances for fault, which makes allowances for learning. And um, I have to say that it's actually something that I feel very confident in, in right now in the role that I'm currently in. Oh, that's brilliant. Well, congratulations. Um, Lisa, let's delve a little bit into your successes and, and learnings. So um, for me, I must say last year was a great year for me. I, I had some great achievements, which... I can also say I feel very blessed for. Um, so, you know, I was promoted into the the head of channel role. Actually, before I've been in the role for, for the last year. Uh, but, you know, 2019 gave me an opportunity within the, the company that I'm at with Veeam. Um, we're lucky because as a global organization, we've looked at programs um, that that address diversity and inclusion when it comes to, to females in the IT industry. So we've actually got a program um, which we run on an annual basis called the Women in Green. And um, we actually, we target 30 ladies um, from a global standpoint within the organization. And um, for that year, you once you're nominated, you have access to the top leadership within the organization. Uh, you do go on a whole mentoring uh, program with them. So, you know, even though I've been at Veeam for seven years, um, it, for me, I felt so, so privileged and honored to be given the opportunity because, you know, being in Africa, you don't always, you, you go to these, uh, these conferences, you go and meet people, but uh, you don't always have access to top management uh, the way you may have if you're sitting at head office. So I, I used the opportunity um, for the year to, to make new contacts within the business, uh, to, you know, to also raise my profile within the company, but also to learn from it. Because, you know, mentoring is something that I feel you can also give back. So I actually have done that. So I was lucky, uh, I was asked at the end of last year if I wanted to become a mentor as well. So I love that I, I got given that opportunity and that we have got these kinds of programs that don't just talk about raising your profile in the in the organization, but we also went through a lot of um, different topics around, mm. as I mentioned, diversity and inclusion and how how to deal with that in the workplace. You know, you have to take these opportunities that come come across your path and use them, um, yeah. not just for your good, but to help others as well. Yeah, it sort of step into that network, which is also quite daunting at times. Um, Ameshni, yes, have, have you seen different challenges in the public sector? Um, no, uh, I, I wouldn't say so. Um, I think that, um, you know, public, I've, I've worked across uh, kind of the industries. So I've been in consulting, I've worked in corporate uh, from an FMCG industry perspective, and now over the last three years uh, in the public sector space. Uh, I think each industry brings its own uh, pros and cons, but I think as an uh, individual kind of growing from a career perspective in the tech space, um, I wouldn't say so. Uh, I think that, you know, from a uh, success factor perspective, I think uh, what's really important as an individual, I think, uh, or what, what I found uh, is important from a success point of view is, is probably just to be clear on where you want to go to. Uh, you know, I think every person's career path is different and it means different things for different people. Uh, for some people, that means, you know, growing up that ladder. For others, it means specialization. Uh, for others, it means work-life balance. And so I think, you know, for you to feel successful, it's about whether you're achieving what is important to you as an individual. And I think uh, if you work on that, um, you know, I think that it makes a huge difference in defining success. And that's why I think you'll, you know, we all define success differently uh, depending mm. on what it is that we want to be and who we want to be. Um, and so I always say that, you know, 
uh, when speaking or coaching uh, kind of females in the industry or just um, kind of others around me, um, I, that's that's kind of one of my first questions is, is what is it that you want to achieve as an individual? Who do you want to be? And I think if you work that as your core passion uh, and work around what it is that you're doing, um, that, you know, you'll find the success that you're looking for. Mm, mm. Now, I love that. It's that, that sort of saying from Sheryl Sandberg, the CEO of Facebook, you know, she sort of says lean in. And it's, it very is very much sort of with that theme, lean into your opportunities that are presented to you. Now, Carrie, um, what about the technology industry still excites you? And if you weren't doing what you're currently doing, what else? would you be doing? I think uh, technology in itself, whether you're actually developing the tech or working in it, just the fact that it's leading edge and ever changing is awesome because it's you always have something new. There's never a dull day. And, uh, you know, really what I said before is that my focus is on the people side and there's always amazing people coming up with fresh ideas. And that to me is just amazing about tech. But probably if I wasn't in the tech side, um, totally pivoting and totally different from what I would be doing. But um, I have a d bit of a dream with my sisters to have a, a women's wellness clinic really focused kind of on holistic health and wealth creation for women um, who haven't had the right opportunities. So that's a totally different uh, uh, pivot from tech, um, but really just a passion I think I have. That's great. Um, and again, it sort of speaks to that you know, women, women empowerment and, and sort of coaching and mentoring. Lisa, you've had a very exciting uh, journey, I would say, within different technology companies. If if you weren't doing what you're currently doing, what, what else would you be doing? You know, I think we always joke about um, being in the IT industry because um, it can be so good for you, but it can also have its negatives. Uh and, you know, I think Sharon said it earlier about that work-life balance and finding, uh, you know, just that balance in life. Um, so as much as I love IT and I love being in this industry and I can't actually imagine uh, myself for, from a business perspective being anywhere else right now, I mean, if I had to really, you know, just daydream, I think, um, and I had a, a, an endless amount of cash <laughs> that I didn't need to worry about, uh, about anything else, um, I think I would want to live out my passion. And I mean, I love mountain biking. So, you know, I'm a lady, but I, I'm also quite a tomboy. So um, I love being out in nature. Um, I'd love to own like my own trails and have a little coffee shop where, you know, I could um, offer people some artisan coffees while we, after we've had a nice mountain bike ride. And yeah, you know, maybe giving back to our local communities. Uh, so for me, that's, that would be my dream. But, you know, uh, IT is what it is for now. <laughs> 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 and it obviously still excites you. Um, so Sharon, your your current role within Old Mutual um, is quite a unique one and very sort of forward thinking. What about technology still excites you? And if you weren't doing what, what you are doing, what else would it be? Um, so what about technology excites me? Pretty much everything, <laughs> I think. Um, well, at least in the space that I'm in, um, we get to do a lot of really cool things that I think always sort of felt like you watch Garten and you think, okay, this is what China or Japan or some other country is doing. You know, it's really far off and it's not something that's within our reach. Um, but here we are pioneering. So what excites me about it is doing things that I think a large amount of people tend to think is very complex and very difficult and uh, that you're likely not going to be able to do it. So I see it as a challenge and I take that challenge. Um, what also excites me about technology is the fact that it frees up your time and your capability to do a whole lot, um, a whole lot of things, you know, use your time more effectively. And um, likewise, if I didn't have uh, responsibilities, I had all the money in the world and I could do just about anything, then uh, what I do is combine my passion, um, which is I love traveling. I absolutely love it. Um, I would want to travel the world um, doing what I love doing, which is traveling, but at the same time, working in technology, doing two things. One, teaching not just females, but teaching people how to actually use technology to change their lives. 
and then helping companies start up stuff. And I say stuff because, you know, people go, okay, so what's the plan? What's the roadmap? What's all the incremental drops you want to do? And I'm like, that's actually not very entrepreneurial. You know, what's your problem? What's your challenge? And yeah, let's figure out how we do this. And maybe it's not this roadmap. Maybe it's little small things that we do along the way. Um, but often what I find is that people don't know how to envision that. People don't understand how to just break away from rules and methodologies and, you know, very strict regime and um, outcomes focused um, ways of working. So I'd actually like to travel, learn and teach um, and most importantly, spend that time with my family uh, whilst I do that, because I want to be able to sit on a beach and do that. If, uh, if that's possible. Sounds, sounds like the dream. <laughs> sounds like the dream. Anyone else subscribing? <laughs> um, awesome. Yeah, thanks, Sharon. Um, uh, and then lastly, Wendy, should our conversation be about women in tech or should we be focusing on diversity as a whole in organizations? I think it's a very interesting question um, and a very pertinent one in South Africa. I don't think it really should be either or. Um, I think that as a country that is so diverse and culturally rich as South Africa, we should be focused on inclusiveness and representation of the entire nation. Um, I really think it should be about including all races, genders, disabilities, cultures, religions. You know, the more I think about it, the more we have such a benefit as a country to have this richness. It gives us such an edge. You know, I think about the possibilities of having so many viewpoints, so many different ways of thinking or perceptions across multiple races, religions, cultures. Um, and if we incorporated that, we would have the most holistic organization um, incorporating all of those different viewpoints and angles. Um, I think at the moment, we are sadly quite far from this as a country right now, but I do think the conversations are starting to happen. Um, and the more that we acknowledge these shortages and the more that we talk about it and we share the information, we, we share the statistics, um, I think the more we're able to make those changes that we need to, to move towards a diversity within the organization. But we need to do this without excuses or without defensiveness. So. I truly believe that the more open we are, the more we acknowledge it, the more chance we actually have of, of fixing it and becoming, you know, a truly diverse organization, no matter what it is, whether it be women or just diversity in general. Mm. That's a brilliant point. And Numfundo, as you said, you've got a seat at the table. Um, what is your experience and what are the conversations that you are having about diversity uh, in organizations as a, as a whole? So we're definitely having um, these conversations um, within our organizations and actually in my previous organizations, there's definitely um, been body setups where we have um, such conversations. But obviously, lately, it's been sparked a lot by what um, has been happening around us in the world. Um, so that has really sort of like resuscitated um, constant conversations around these. And we also see it a lot, especially like in manufacturing companies. Um, I'm not sure if everybody else has experienced it, but with every single meeting that we have, we start out with um, a DNI session and a safety session. DNI will be diversity and inclusion, where one person will actually be able to to comment on what is currently being done within the organization around that or where they actually saw an opportunity um, as to where it could be a learning experience for people around um, diversity or where we could have actually actioned one of our action points um, in terms of diversity and in inclusion. So it's definitely something that um, is discussed about, but one thing I've also sort of noticed a lot is that we also, still a bit scared to talk about it openly and honestly. Um, and we're also still a bit unsure as to what to do exactly. Um, so whilst we're still within that situation, it becomes very difficult to put together set plans um, in terms of how we can actually make sure that everybody feels um, included in every conversation and in every platform and they feel valued and they feel that whatever they have to bring to the table um, is actually um, valued within the organization. So we still do have quite um, a while to go, but um, it definitely is baby steps, but let's keep the conversations going. Um, let's keep them open and honest and in doing so, keep an open mind and understand that mm. it's not an attack on everybody 
um, people's viewpoints will definitely differ. When I joined Johnson, we did um, a training, an online training on unconscious bias, which revealed quite a lot to myself. Um, there's a lot that I thought, oh, no, I don't do this. No, there's no <laughs> way. Um, I'm very open-minded. But in doing that training, I learned a lot about myself that I actually didn't even really know or even think that <laughs> I'm actually yeah. capable of being a certain way. So it, it, it's really about being open-minded and being open to different suggestions, different viewpoints, and understanding that a different viewpoint isn't necessarily something that goes against your viewpoint. It's just a different way of thinking, a different way of living, and it's also fueled by different experiences. So we need to get to a point where we learn to bring all of that together for all of our benefits, and I do believe it definitely will be for our, can only be for our benefit. Uh, I'm a person who likes to understand everybody's um, thinking process, even though I won't necessarily agree what people say, but it's I like to understand how you thought that was okay or how you got to a particular decision. Um, just for my understanding, it's for, so that I know how to better deal with people and how to actually even relate to people to also understand what's actually really important to each individual. Um, so yeah, I, I actually really love diversity and I love learning about different people. Thanks. Yeah, I think I think those blind spots are so important to understand and unpack. Um, so I just want to wrap up by uh, sort of citing some very interesting information from a, a PwC Africa article. So the chief economist, Lulu Krugel, actually said that, so I'm going to quote her, she says, our research shows that unless we change various cultural and behavioral drivers within organizations, the matter of diversity is unlikely to, to be resolved anytime soon. And that focusing on inclusivity and bringing more women into emerging tech and workforce in general, it'll help bring novel viewpoints and ideas into emerging tech. And so the economists actually estimate that if we close the gender gap by just 10% in South Africa, that we could achieve higher economic growth effects, such as 3.2% increase in GDP, 6.5% reduction in the number of unemployed job seekers, and that closing the gender gap in that this is both they, they refer to pay and um hiring um that we could alleviate poverty so low income households could receive an estimated two two point nine percent more income than previously estimated so yes i just want to thank our women so much carrie sharon lisa amesh and wendy for doing great work forging the way for inclusivity in the workplace and putting your time aside for today and also want to thank Kayla and Val from our marketing teams for putting this session together. So we're going to welcome questions and we will ensure to load these webinars onto our YouTube channel, onto RSUB's YouTube channel for those who missed it, those who want to share it and those who want to rewatch it. And so we want to say have a wonderful Women's Month and thank you and goodbye.